So one issue that can come up if we write a really good random test case generator is that we can be overwhelmed by the success of our own bug finding effort. At some level, we should be so lucky to have this problem. But on the other hand, if you take a large software project that's never been subjected to random testing and hit it with a sophisticated random tester, it's not at all unexpected that you'll be overwhelmed by the number of bugs. So what will happen is you'll start a random testing run, you will leave for the weekend, and the next time you come in, there might be 250 bugs. And so the way we want to visualize the situation is like this. So we have the input domain, of course, and all I'm going to show here is inputs that found bugs. So there's a bunch of them. Now what we have is sort of a fundamental quandary, which is the question, do we have 250 test inputs that all, for one reason or another, all happen to map to the same buggy output? Or on the other hand, do we have a situation where we found perhaps 250 different bugs? And without looking in more detail at what's going on, there's no way we can tell. So most likely, so almost certainly, the, the truth is in the middle. Almost certainly we found 10 bugs or maybe 50 bugs, but we probably didn't get so lucky as to find 250 bugs. And we probably weren't so unlucky as to trigger the same bug 250 times, although of course that kind of thing does happen. And so there are basically two ways out of this problem. First solution, pick a bug and report it. And it's totally irrelevant which bug it is. It could be a random bug. You know, most likely what we'd sort of want to do is eyeball them a little bit somehow and see which one seems the most serious, but it doesn't matter. Let's say we report this test case here. So that goes to our developers. And what they're going to do is fix it, of course. So this buggy part of the, of the output space goes away in the next version of the system. So now we don't have range of the system, we have range prime, which is just the range of the next version. And so we still have exactly the same input space, and but the behavior of the software under test has changed a little bit. And now something interesting happens. Not only did that particular failure go away, but perhaps some of the other ones did. And so perhaps all of these over here stopped being inputs that trigger failures anymore. And of course that's great because it's nice to see that they fixed a bug that covers such a large part of the input space. On the other hand, another possibility is all of the remaining bug triggering inputs that we found still trigger bugs. And so what do we do? Well, of course, we just go ahead and report another bug. And the strategy will keep working. As soon as we get a new version of the system that fixes a bug we've reported, we can just do another one. So this isn't a bad mode of operation. And what this works for is basically for smallish systems where bugs can be fixed rather quickly, there's no problem at all reporting one bug at a time. On the other hand, if the people fixing bugs have a slow fix cycle, so let's say we're only testing actual released versions of Microsoft Word, for example, we're only getting a new version every couple of years. So if they fix one bug in Microsoft Word every couple of years, the question is how long do we think that'll take for them to arrive at a correct version of Microsoft Word? And the answer, of course, is they never will because they're putting bugs in faster than we would take them out using a one bug at a time sort of a model. This can easily be the case for real software products. So if that's the situation, if reporting one bug at a time doesn't work, we're forced to use a different strategy. And I call that bug triage. 